I am Zach Gage. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with me, I'm a game developer and a conceptual artist from New York City, and I've been developing games professionally for around seven years, mostly on mobile, but I've done some stuff on other platforms as well. Um, if you have heard of me, it's probably because of either Spell Tower or Ridiculous Fishing or Lose Lose or Sage Solitaire or Tharsis or most recently Really Bad Chess, um, but I've definitely done a lot of other things, and I'll talk about some of those today. Um, also, just a quick note, if you've ever seen me talk before, I talk really fast and I try to put a lot of information into my slides, so if you don't speak English as a first language, I'm sorry, and if you're somebody who really likes taking detailed notes, I'm sorry, you probably shouldn't do that. Um, but I do put all of my talks online with all of the notes and literally everything that I said, so just go to my Twitter after and I'll t put it there eventually. Uh, also, thanks Colin. Uh, I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited to get to talk to all of you about the weird stuff that I've learned over the years from doing physical uh, game design. So things like using dice and cards and billiards balls. Uh, so, um, although I primarily make digital games for the last few years, I spent a lot of time exploring more old-fashioned game components. And I love these kinds of objects for a number of reasons. Uh, one, they're accessible because they are familiar to everyone. So not everybody out in the world knows how to use a controller to navigate a 3D space. Not everybody knows how to circle strafe. Not everybody knows how to time a 2D jump. But everybody out there knows how to use things like dice and playing cards. That's just like a natural skill that we've all had growing up and playing board games, um, even if you barely played board games more than Monopoly. Two. Um, a lot of these tools represent the basis of many things that we hold dear in digital games. So set collection, randomness, physics, cards, dice, and physical sports like billiards are the first ways that game designers were able to explore those concepts. Three, they have a built-in culture. Each type of implement comes with its own deep culture of players and designers. So if you think there are a lot of puzzle platformers out there, you should look up traditional card games. Traditional card games are literally like the app store more than an app. Um, and four, they're so quick to prototype with, this is a really big deal for me. Um, so I've been delving into this world for a few years now, and I've come out of it with five traditional card game designs, two dice games, a billiards game, and a lot of half-functional prototypes, and a lot of hard-earned lessons. So here are some of the lessons. Let's start with cards. Any game that you make with playing cards is going to fall into one of two categories. Either it is a game where you exhaust the whole deck of playing cards, or a sub-deck, or it is a game during which you only exhaust a small portion of the deck or subdeck. So a full game would be like War, you'll go through your whole deck. Poker, you only go through a little bit of the deck every hand and then you shuffle it again. And each of these categories has their own considerations. Um, in a full deck game, you have to worry about something called forward memory, which is a term that I made up and I will explain to you in a minute. And in a partial deck game, you have to grapple primarily with significant randomness. Uh, in either one of these, you have to handle card counting and although card counting is a much bigger problem in full deck games, because it can literally ruin the games, um, you end up having to deal with it in both situations, and I'll explain what card counting is and why that happens in a moment. Um, and also, you know, obviously I'm talking about traditional game components, but all of this stuff has tons of relevance to making digital games and exploring digital games, and a lot of the digital games that I've made drew lessons from this stuff. So, let's start with forward memory. Uh, so forward memory, as I said, is a term that I made up, and primarily it is a problem in full deck games, although it can show up in partial deck games depending on how those games are structured. The general idea is that in any game where you're making sets of cards, the sets of cards you make have a significant influence on the sets of cards that you can make in the future. So an example of this is imagine that we have a really small deck of cards, right? Just, just two aces, two twos, two threes, and two fours. And if we're dealt four cards up randomly out of this deck, let's say we get a straight, the next four cards we get are going to be another straight, because that's all that's left in the deck. That seems really obvious, but it actually is not when you start using bigger sets of cards. Um, suppose, example, we were dealt one, two, two, three, so we have like a pair. Our next set of cards will be another pair. It's a little spooky, even though there are only eight cards in the deck. 
Um, so this is a simple example, right? But it holds true with bigger sets as well. If you're working through a 52-card deck and you start making a lot of pairs, you will continue to make a lot of pairs as you make your way through that deck. And it's a really big problem in full deck games because once players realize that this is happening, they will bail out of the game if their first couple of hands don't go well because they know that it means that the rest of the game is not going to go well. So to deal with this uh, is actually pretty difficult because it's an inherent quality of a set of cards or a set of anything that you're making your way through. But you can give the player some degree of control over it by varying the window through which they see cards. So instead of saying, giving them a static window of cards, like you always get four cards, if you vary the window and say, OK, sometimes you'll get one, sometimes two, sometimes three, or sometimes four cards, it changes a lot about how much control they can have over this um, phenomenon. So let's imagine the same card deck, but with variable windows. So say we are dealt uh, ace, ace, two, three. So um, and we remove the pair of aces, right? So now we only have two fours, a two, and a three left in the deck, so we're going to end up getting three more pairs no matter how these cards are dealt out to us. Or, assuming the original set of cards, if we remove the one, two, three, we have a chance of getting a one, two, three, four in the next hand, or we have a chance of getting some other kind of pair. Or we could have just removed the one, hoping for a one, two, three, four, and cascading sets of pairs. So already we can see this tiny deck has opened up quite a little just by changing the number of cards that people pull out and the window size that they're viewing the deck. Um, so that's forward memory. I hope that made sense. Card counting. So card counting is one of the biggest issues that you're going to encounter when you're designing a traditional card game. And my rule of thumb is if players can count, they will count, or they will assume that everybody else is counting. So if your game is countable and you really need to dig into this, you have to make it easy for players to count. And if your game isn't countable, you have to make it really clear that counting would be impossible or impractical. So uh, in case you're not aware of what card counting is, I feel like I should cover it. Most people think card counting means keeping track of every single card in the deck, its position, who's holding it, etc. But that is not what card counting is. Card counting is a simple system for maintaining information about the likelihood of something happening within a closed set of possibilities. So for example, in blackjack, where card counting comes from culturally, the way that you count cards is you start at zero in your head, and every time you see a two or a six, you add one, and every time you see a king or face card or ten, you subtract one. And the higher your count gets, the more the likelihood of you have of winning against the dealer, because if the dealer pulls a lot of big cards from the deck, they'll bust. So as you can see, Counting cards in a single game of blackjack is actually very easy and has nothing to do with where any of the cards are in the deck. It's just a way to manipulate the randomness and the understanding of the fact that as you pull things out of a set, what's left in the set shrinks. And, um, so, uh, and it's important, again, that this is a thing that is easy in blackjack, because if it wasn't easy in blackjack, blackjack wouldn't be any fun for anyone to play at all, because people would feel like they needed to just grind it out really hardcore, like they were super intense chess players with photographic memories. Um, so, again, because of that, if card counting is possible in your game, you need to build it into the game. And so an example of how to do this is, last year I released a game called Meyer, and in that game players are trying to capture each other's cards by forming hidden pairs or straights on the table. And in Meyer, card counting is really, really easy. So in Meyer, pairs are more powerful than straights, and so the most important generalizable information you can have in a hand of Meyer is, am I holding any pairs, and do I think my opponent is holding any pairs? Um, the way that it works is each player in Meyer starts with half the deck, so either all the black cards or all the red cards, which means that each player has 13 pairs in their deck to begin with. Um, and any time, like we saw with forward memory, that a single card is removed out of a deck, it changes the probability substantially of what's going to be pulled on any given hand out of the, that deck. So any time you remove one card from a deck, the probability of a player pulling a pair goes down, and any time you remove two cards that are a pair, the probability goes up. So say, for example, just to make this clear, if I removed all the cards except for the two aces from the red player's deck, then the red player is going to pull those two aces 100% of the time. If I remove all the cards except for one ace from their deck, they're never going to see um, a, a pair ever because they only have one card in their deck. I know that seems super obvious and stupid, but it's important to think about this stuff because it holds true even on the larger sets of cards. So when you're playing 
the game, all you need to do to figure out whether or not the other player is going to have a higher likelihood of pairs than you is look into the captured cards, which are face up, and say, okay, what have I captured of theirs and what have they captured of mine? So if I'm the black player, I've captured the two, three, four of red, and the red player has captured my pair of twos, the seven, and the six of mine. So even though when you add all these cards up, I have a lower score, I only have seven points, and the black player has 17 points, I have actually captured more of their split cards, and, they, and because they've captured a pair of mine, my odds of having a pair are, go, are way higher than the other players, and because of that, on my next turn, even though I'm technically down in points, the, uh, the top player has to be a lot more careful about how they play because I am more likely to have a pair. Um, so that's an example of building card counting system into your game, but there are easier ways to build in card counting. So, for example, in Scoundrel, an older game of mine, you're primarily worried about two black aces, the ten of hearts, and the ten of diamonds, and because these are the most powerful cards in the deck. And so even though I said card counting wasn't about keeping track of card placement, when you only have to track four cards, you can keep track of card placement. So this is like a narrative, thematic way of doing card counting. Um, oh man, I'm going so slowly. Okay, so um, Sage Solitaire, and, which is an older game that I made, and Klondike Solitaire take another route, and that is they make card counting impossible or impractical. So um, in, in Sage, even if you know all of the cards that you've removed from the deck, it doesn't matter because that information is not going to help you in the majority of the game. There is actually one moment in Sage Solitaire where you do benefit from card counting, and that's at the very end of the game. So here, I'm trying to locate a pair on this table, and I have one chance to remove a card. And so I'm thinking, do I remove the five and see what's under it, or do I remove the king and see what's under it? Um, and it would really help me to know uh, if there were more fives in the deck or more kings in the deck and try to locate what pair I'm going for. And uh, actually, Michael Bro suggested uh, way after launch that what I could have done is I could have made it so that just the last cards in the deck are face up um, because that would have alleviated this problem. Here I would have known, all right, I remove the king, I get the pair of twos, and, and that's good. So uh, if I could design a game, the game again, that's probably how I would have done it. Okay, so next topic is heavy randomness. So if you're dealing with a partial deck game, you're going to have a ton of randomness. It's easy to see this in a game like poker, where you might have pocket aces and the other person might have a two-cent offsuit. Um, a lot of times, uh, my general advice here is just to embrace this randomness and try to compensate it with short hands or some other mechanic like bluffing. Randomness is part of the deep culture of card games, and people who are playing card games expect it and enjoy it. I know this sounds like obvious advice, but it's so tempting to try to bring your desires to bear on the tools when those tools are fighting you on it. Um, and I think it's more important to learn from the strengths of tools rather than to force them into something that they're not. Um, I'm going to skip the example of that because I'm running out of time and move on to dice. When I, when I first started exploring dice games, the prevailing wisdom that I heard in game academic circles was that dice should never decide anything, rather that dice should give you the random input so that you could then make the de decision yourself. Um, the reasoning for this, I imagine, is that if you tell someone, let's play a game, we'll flip this coin, and if it's heads, I win, if it's tails, you win, that's not a very fun game, and most players would stop playing it because it just feels random. But the thing is, this is bad logic, uh, the reason that players are bored isn't because they didn't care about the result of the flip. Is, sorry, the reason that players are bored is because they didn't care about the result of the flip, not because the flip is designing the game. The only thing that determines how fun a dice game is is how much you care about the result. My favorite example of this is the way that my friend Doug Wilson used to play Rock, Paper, Scissors. Rock, Paper, Scissors, it definitely has its share of fans, but I think we can agree it's not a great game. Uh, it's mostly a tool to decide things, like flipping a coin. Uh, but my friend Doug, in grad school, had a long-running game that he played once a day at the end of the day versus his roommate, and they'd think real hard all day about what they were going to throw, and then they'd throw one time, and then they'd mark it on the wall. And uh, I think it's amazing to look at what that backing does to the game. Suddenly you have this context, suddenly this thing that's like very, very random is super meaningful. Another example in a game that I made is this game called Tilt that I designed last year with my friend Rob Dubbin, or two years ago. It's for three people, and everyone starts with five dice, and your goal is to collect all the dice. So to start, everybody rolls a die all at once, 
And starting with the lowest value die, you have the opportunity to either go out or to roll again. And if you roll again, you take another die from your stack and you roll it. And your goal is to roll a number that is either equal to or higher than the highest die that's already there. Um, and if you do, then you become the leader, and then the play progresses to your left, and they can either roll die or back out. Um, and play continues until one person, uh, until all the people are either out of dice or have decided to pass, and then whoever is in the lead gets all the dice in the pot, and then you start again. Um, and uh, the important thing is that this game is super, super random because you're just rolling dice. Um, but the way that the rules work lends a narrative to the randomness so that the results feel important to players. So for example, if I get upset as the red player and I roll my dice one die at a time trying to beat a six, which is a stupid idea, <laughs> but then on my final die, I roll a six and now I'm in the lead. And then green rolls and they roll a six on their first try and I lose all my dice, that's awesome, right? Because we had this whole narrative about it, and even though this is essentially the same as a coin flip game, there's a structure, and that makes the game work. Um, all right. <laughs> so don't fear randomness. This is, uh, randomness is awesome. It's awesome in craps. It's awesome of the river card and all in poker hands. There are a lot of games that are random, and random is really fun. You just need to make sure that you've come up with a structure that makes people care about it. Uh, and I, I will talk a little bit more about that and how it re uh, happens in Tharsis, which is a game that I released uh, this year with my friends at Choice Provisions. But um, before I get to that, I need to cover one other weird thing about dice, and that is that they're not very random. Um, at least D6s are not very random. So the biggest issue with D6s is that you're often not rolling just one of them in a game. And if you're rolling more than one die and you're adding them together in any way, you very quickly make your way into a bell curve situation where the player can assume a expected return off of any given roll of dice. Um, and so if you're using D6s in your game, it's really important to build a framework that makes it difficult for the player to calculate their expected return, or at least makes it so that the player has to change their methodology for calculating their expected return constantly. Um, this happens in Vegas all the time. This is why Vegas games have loads of side bets. Here, there's a game you're playing, but you can also bet on pair plus, and that has returns, and you can also bet on anti-bonus, anti and that has returns. Uh, it's harder to do this in a traditional game than in a Vegas game, but it is possible. So Tharsis is a space adventure that I made with Choice Provisions and released this year. In Tharsis, we did a lot of work just to make sure that, not just to make sure that the randomness is holding, but also to make sure that players care substantially about the results of everything. So as I was designing this game, I looked at it as a system designed to build a narrative around dice. In Tharsis, every character has up to five dice. Uh, oops, that's weird. Oh yeah, has up to five dice that they can use in a variety of different situations. So you spend each turn using your crew and sending them to situations, rolling their dice, and then we have a bunch of structures in place for where you can put those dice and how you can use them. Um, for example, often in rooms there's an event, all the events are bad, and you clear them by adding dice up. So this event requires 27 points worth of dice to clear. Also, on an event, there are hazards. Hazards are things that you don't want to roll. So when you roll against this event, you don't want to roll a one, and you don't want to roll a three, otherwise bad things will happen to you. Crew members also have abilities, and each room has its own ability, and those are used by putting dice into them that respect certain rules. So on the right, a die has to be five or higher. On the left, the dice have to be equal to each other. And then lastly, there's a global dice pool called Research, which accepts any die, but it only accepts one of each. And each die, no matter what the number on it, is worth one point towards buying those cards at the bottom, and once you buy a card, it clears out the dice from the bottom up. And so what happens is this kind of system is dynamically valuing the dice, whereas it's generally better to have high rolling dice, and here you might have a situation where your entire research project is filled up except for the one, and you're trying to buy a six cost card, so now you're going into a room hoping for a one. Um, because we're valuing dice in so many different ways, like all these different arrows are pointing to different things, um, and those ways change dynamically depending on the situation, it's very difficult for dice rolls to become bell curved. And that also means that at the start of the turn, players have to come up with a plan for what they're going to do with each of their characters on a turn, where they're going to send them, how they're going to use their dice, how they're going to replenish the dice that they have or use research cards. 
And what ends up happening is, because we're dealing with randomness, you're not just coming up with a primary plan of action, you're coming up with a series of sub-plans. And that means that when the dice don't roll your way, the first time it doesn't happen, you're like, all right, it's cool, I have this, I have another option. The fourth time it doesn't happen, you're like, oh my god, if I don't pull this off, I'm screwed. And so what it's doing is it's ramping up the tension and the meaningfulness of all of the dice rolls as they become more meaningful to the player. Okay, so lastly, uh, I want to talk about billiards. Um, I've been working on a billiards game that I'm really psyched to share with everybody, but I'm not going to share it until next year. But it has been a very interesting experience working on a billiards game. Um, and so I wanted to share one of the issues that I ran up against, and that is that uh, in billiards, probably no game more than billiards involves players setting their own difficulty without the knowledge that they are, in fact, setting their own difficulty. Um, when you line up a shot in a game of pool, you're making a lot of choices before you even take the shot. You're looking at the whole table and you're evaluating a range of possibilities, trying to find one that's both good and that you have the skill level to do. So essentially, you're designing your own challenge every single shot you take in poker. And if the structure of the challenge you're attempting doesn't provide the proper incentives, uh, you'll always end up doing the easiest thing and you'll decide the game is boring. If the structural incentives are too powerful, you'll try something that's way outside of your skill range and you'll decide the game is too hard. And you won't even realize that this is sort of your fault um, because you're being incentivized by the system that you're inside of. So making a good billiards game, and actually I think this is true for any kind of game, is a process of making sure that the player at all times has the tools they need not just to perform well in the game, but the information that they need to properly assess the return on everything that they're attempting. So this is why, for example, arbitrarily rewarding a player a two times multiplier for shooting off the bank in pool is a really dangerous idea because players of all levels will be enticed by that multiplier, but novice players not only won't have the skill to pull it off, they won't have the skill to recognize how difficult the shot actually is. So opportunities for scoring higher need to show themselves only to players as that player's ability to make good on them increases. So 8-Ball actually does a really good job at this. At first, it feels like the goal of 8-Ball is to just to sink all the balls in the pockets. But as you improve at 8-Ball, you realize that leaving the cue ball in an opportune place to take the next shot after you sink a ball matters. And the further you improve, you start to realize that leaving the ball in an inopportune place for your opponent if you miss is also important. So this means that for a professional pool player, every shot is a weighing of all of these three values. Make a shot, make the next shot, screw the other player if I miss. But a beginner pool player is not weighed down because they're just trying to sink the balls. They don't even know about the other options yet. So, of course, in pool and in eight ball, besides sinking a ball, these things are strategies, they're not really rules. Um, but if you set out to reward strategies with concrete points, as I'm trying to do in my billiards game, it becomes more difficult and it becomes a lot more important to be careful about how you're allocating those points. So, just to wrap up, uh, cards, forward memory, dangerous and set constrained systems, Card counting, either directly support it or make it impossible and make that clear. Randomness, don't fear embracing it. It's the core of card culture and dice culture. Dice, they're not actually that random. And what makes dice good is input or output randomness. No, nope, it's just caring about the result. Billiards, build a system where players set their own challenges without explicitly realizing that they do this. Too hard, and they think it's too hard, too easy, and they get bored and opportunities for higher scoring should show themselves only as players' ability to make good on them increases. Whew, thanks.